Welcome to Revealing God's Truth. My name is Jack. I'm an evangelist. Part of my ministry is this channel, and our goal is to help fellow Christians to grow in Christ and to live more Christ-like so that we can show Christ through our actions and not just through what we say. If you're not a Christian but would like to know more about what it means to be a Christian, I will put a card above that you can click on. It will take you to a video that will offer more explanation and hopefully answer at least some of your questions. God tells us to let our light shine, and we ask that you help us to do that by sharing this content with others. We hope that you get a blessing from the following and we thank you for joining us as we seek to reveal God's truth in His Word. Welcome back to Revealing God's Truth. I've got a, a study that is a little unusual. And God gave this to me, or, or he, he put it on my heart a couple months ago. And I, I just wrote it down and... I had a general idea of, of where he wanted me to go with it, and I, I finally had some time to to work it out, and and it was interesting. the The title of the of the study is going to be Stockholm Syndrome, <clears throat> and you'll see as we go along how this relates to uh, to spiritual things. I, I knew the the term Stockholm syndrome, and I knew uh, basically where the term came from. But you know, a lot of times you'll you'll hear something, and you know, you try to take things at face value, and and you just trust that what you've heard is is the case. Well. You know, when it comes to, to spiritual things, when it comes to especially putting something out there for others, as, as you know, is the whole point of, of this channel, <clears throat> you want to make sure that what you're saying is the truth. So what I did is I went, I, I did some research on where this term came from, and overall, you know, I, I had the, the overalls right. But I had no idea of the particulars uh, of where this came from. Now, the Stockholm Syndrome is defined as a condition in which hostages uh, develop a bond with their captors during captivity. And... Uh, it was first used to describe what happened to the hostages of a failed bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden in 1973 in which the hostages were held for six days. So uh, the, the verse that I would like for you to, to keep in mind as we, as we go through this is Galatians 5 verse 1 stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith christ had made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage so I, i've i've kind of struggled with how to present this because there's just there's so much uh to the to the story itself so that you can find a, a few different accounts online but there's there was one uh, written by uh, a gentleman in the New Yorker in 1973 which he I mean he you know as was back when there were actually investigative reporters and he I mean the the article was was massive. It, I didn't think I was ever going to get finished with it. So I was trying to figure out exactly how to present this 
and present it in a way that uh, we can relate it to to Christianity. So what I've done is I've got sort of an overview of some things, and then I have almost a summary of the events that took place. So the first thing I want to do is I want to to speak of the the ones directly involved and, and just tell you who they are. And then I'm going to go through the story. And as we go through the story, I, I'm going to attempt to show how this relates to the to the Christian uh, life or to Christianity in, in general. All right, so there were there were two thieves. Now I will not uh, mention the names of the thieves. They are, they are thief one and thief two. That's I, I'm not going to uh, promote them by by mentioning their names. So it was two thieves and four bank employees. So the first of the bank employees well, was Kristen. She had worked at the bank for approximately three years, and she had had plans at the time of the at the time of this. Uh, they called it the bank drama. Is is what the police and the media at the time called it. So at the time of this bank drama, um, she had had plans to leave the bank to pursue a study in social studies or, or something along those lines. So that's Kristen. Then there's uh, Brigitta or Brigitta. I think it's Brigitta. Uh, she had worked at the bank for 10 years. She had a husband and two daughters. Then there's Elizabeth. Uh, she had worked at the bank for just over one year and had plans uh, to leave the bank to be a nurse. And then the one male hostage was Sven. And it didn't say how long he had been there. It just said he was a, a junior executive. Uh, his parents were government officials and his mother basically made him get the job and uh, got him the the job uh, because she said that she was he was taking too long in in their words to find himself so you know you have to take the the culture into account but basically you have a, a an, an individual who isn't getting on the ball and and you know turning into his own person he's just you know, staying at home trying to live off uh, mom and dad. All right, then you got Thief One. Uh, he was considered very dangerous. He had been convicted. Uh, the sentence was like three years. He had served half of it, and they, I guess this is something they do, but he was out on furlough, and he didn't go back to jail. So that's Thief One. He's the, he's the main, he's... Uh, referred to in, in the article and by uh, the uh, hostages themselves as the robber. Thief 2 was serving a six was serving six years for armed robbery and an accessory to murder of a police officer, had escaped several times and had served time with Thief 1. So that's the main that's the main characters that we will be dealing with as we as we go through this. So Thief One, like I said, he had he had escaped from prison, meaning he didn't escape from the prison. They let him out on furlough and he didn't go back. Uh, I don't know what to say about that, but so he arrives at the bank. He has a gun. 
he has uh, a large canvas uh, um, suitcase which has extra ammo, a knife, plastic explosive, uh, blasting caps, fuses, and rope. He was prepared. So he, he came prepared. Comes into the, to the bank and immediately starts, you know, fires a couple of shots into the ceiling and uh, I believe, what did he say? He said something. He said, the party has just begun. And the reason that I'm, I'm, I want to give the detail and the background of what's going on is I, I, I know how we as as just we as just people we try to you know disprove or excuse or whatever by saying well this wasn't the case or that wasn't the case. So I'm trying to give these details to show that what we're going to to see that happened here wasn't just well they were they were trying to make it seem this way or nothing. I mean what is what is done is straight up and the way it is so he shows up he has a disguise on he's got toy sunglasses a wig he's dyed his um his eyebrows uh to match the wig I can't remember if he had, I think he had a must, uh, maybe a fake mustache or dyed his mustache. I can't remember. Uh, now, since this was in Sweden, what I found out about Sweden is, is although they, 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 they speak whatever language they speak, he spoke with, he, he spoke English, but he also spoke it with an American accent. Because, he, again, he's trying to hide who he is. And what's interesting is they, they, are, required to, they are required to learn English in, in Sweden. And that makes sense because English is the, the language of business. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's what you have to know to do business internationally. So... And I'm sure it helps with tourism and everything else. So he comes in, and he has three women. He gets one of the 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 male clerks or whatever to um, tie up these three women. This would be uh, the Kristen, uh, Bridget, Bridget, or whatever her name is. And um, Brigetta, I'm sorry, Brigetta and Elizabeth has them tied up, and someone had activated the uh, the silent alarm. So an, an officer in plain clothes shows up. Now, I'm going to stop right there. So here we have this thief. He shows up, and his, in, his intentions and how serious he is is right out there. It's not hidden. His intentions are out there. He's already fired shots. I mean, that's, you know, we see all the time where someone will come in and they'll they'll have their hand in their pocket or even they'll they'll show a gun and they'll rob the place and they'll, then they'll leave without firing a shot. 
So if you come in and you fire a shot, you kind of ratcheted up the situation a little bit. You, you're kind of showing it, hey, this is serious. But he comes in with a disguise. So let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, God, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So here we know that the serpent was Satan. And he took on this disguise because the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field. Well, then let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Again, we see that Satan, when he comes in and tempts and, 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 and throws temptation in our way. It's not straightforward. There's always some disguise used. And here it says he can, he, he can be seen as the angel of light. So this temptation, this leading you astray, can be from a source that you trust. Then we have Matthew 7, verse 15. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Here again, we're told to beware because the, the adversary comes in disguised. Now this is speaking of of false prophets, of preachers and teachers that profess to to be Christian and that they're teaching uh, from God's Word, but yet it's only on the what's on the outside. The problem is what's on the inside does not line up with God's Word. Oh yeah, it'll it'll be really close. It'll be really close to what God's Word says which is another one of the dangers of not using the, the true Bible, which would be your King James Bible. You know, and, and I'm not going to go into that. I almost went off on a, on a tangent there, but if you, we have a, a video that specifically addresses that, if you would like to, to look at that to see what I mean. All right, so... We see the disguise here. The disguise is used to, to fool and to trick. Immediately, Bergetta, remember this plain clothes cop has already showed up. The thief is distracted or he's looking a different way or whatever and she sees the plain clothes cop with his gun and yells out to the cop don't shoot now you know we see that and we say, why in the world would someone do that? Why, you know, that cop could have, he could have got down there and, and, and took the, the thief by surprise and he could have shot the guy. You know, it, it, there, there are six days of, of, of being a hostage and, and going through this could have been averted if, she just hadn't yelled out. And we say, well, why in the world would she do that? Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also 
unto her husband with her, and he did eat. This is immediately after Satan, in his disguise, tempted her and drew, uh, you know, tried to cast doubt on the word of God. So here we we we, it's not just this this lady in this situation. It was what happened at the beginning. So it shows just how fast, just how quick you can be caught up in the deception of sin. Now, this can also apply to the lost. The lost, yes, they're already bound by sin. And the the world and Satan and their own flesh uses whatever means possible to to pull the wool over their eyes that they don't need God, that they don't need salvation to keep them in to keep them hostage. Well, it also applies to the Christian, as we've been been saying, like the prodigal son. The prodigal son he was just like a, a Christian is a child of God, the prodigal son, when he left home and, and went out into sin, at no point did he cease to be that father's son. He was always that father's son. He had backslid. He had went away. He did not listen to the uh, advice of his father. And we know what happened there. But he was always, even when he was away, he was that father's son. The same way a child of God can can get deceived and caught up in sin and get bound back in, in sin. Not, not bound as in, now you're not going to go to heaven, but bound as in, you can't be useful to God because... You're so caught up in this, in sin. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, I can't remember that. Like, how? Brigida. 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 Forget it. Vegeta, yeah. I don't want to say someone's name wrong is why I kind of focus on that for a second. Okay, so anyway, so she says, don't shoot. Well, guess what happens? Thief one fires, hits the officer in the right hand, and causes permanent damage to the officer's hand. There is another plain clothes officer that has uh, that has shown up, and he has that officer to clear the bank, with the exception of those three women that uh, he's he's tied up. Now some of this jumps around a little bit. I, I know it does, and I um, I apologize for that, but it's sort of the way that the the article kind of laid everything out. All right. So, what was his uh, demands? Well, let, no. Let's let's look at the let's look at that first. So he has the officer clear everyone out. One of the things that the devil will try to do is to single you out from everyone else. He'll tell a lost person, "Oh, you're alone. Nobody cares about you. Yeah, you've got family. You know." 10 feet away in the next room, but they don't care nothing about you. He'll, he'll, he'll use that and he'll make you feel isolated. He'll do the same with a Christian. He'll tell the Christian, oh, you know, ain't nobody wants to hear what you have to say. Nobody cares about, uh, you know, what you taught. You know, everybody criticized, you know, whatever. It's, 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 an, isolate, it's an isolation tactic. You know, we see that in the animal kingdom where, you know, the, the predator will, will wait until 
one of the herd separates from the herd and gets isolated and then they'll attack that isolated one because they're alone and you know God's word tells us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together that's for fellowship you know and I mentioned this in one of my my recent studies I think that it's not the purpose of the pastor to stand up and preach about giving your burdens to God all the time. It's not about that. It's not that you should know that. But what we should do, it, it, you know, God's word says, bearing one another's burdens, so fulfilling the law of Christ. We, we should, you know, a lot of times we're told, you know, shouldn't complain, shouldn't complain. Okay, well, that's bearing each other's. When you tell someone, hey, I'm going through this and it's really, it's, it's, it's awful. That's not complaining so much as it is, hey, I've got to, I've got to let this out. I've got to tell someone else this. And the other person should then say, well, hey, why don't we pray about it? Or, hey, I'll be praying for you. Or maybe even, hey, God might tell you, hey, give them, give them a, a, you know, some money or whatever the case may be. But so often we're told, you know, don't, don't complain, don't complain. Well, no, we're not supposed to complain just for the sake of complaining. But we are supposed to fellowship with each other. And when we share our burdens with each other, that helps us to bear each other's burdens instead of coming to church you know every time the doors are open you've got this this downcast look on your face you look like you could you would rather be either anywhere else from there or you just look miserable because of whatever's going on in your life and you expect the preacher to get up and preach on that instead of preaching on you know Jesus which you know, when's the last time you, you you heard a sermon just about how great Jesus is and who Jesus is and what he did and not a salvation message, just a just glorifying and praising him, preaching about how we're to live, not against sin so much as, hey, this is the way you're supposed to be. Oh, no, that's legalist. No, it's not. There's a standard. We're supposed to live by it. It's not being a legalist. But instead of him being able to, to have the, the liberty to preach that, you know, he looks out on the congregation, and he's like, oh, man, this person's going through this, this person's going through this, so I, I, need, to, I need to preach about how, uh, you know, we need to give our burdens to, to God. And if you think that that doesn't happen, if you think that doesn't sway the pastor and he's just all the time minding the Holy Spirit, then you're fooling yourself. You you have to understand that the the especially a pastor that that loves his 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 congregation, he he wants to provide for the congregation, and he's just as human as you are, infallible as you are, and he can allow those feeling to override the Holy Spirit, and because it's from God's Word, you know, miss the fact that, hey, he's not listening to the Holy Spirit. The Bible clearly teaches that you reach a point where you move past those things. You move past that, and you start preaching on the meat of the Word, which is not burdens. All right, so he has the he has the uh, unwounded officer clear the bank. He de this is his demands. Uh, he demands his an accomplice. Now there's the that this is thief two. Thief two is serving that six year sentence. He demands that they bring him his accomplice. He demands seven hundred thousand dollars, two pistols, and a fast car. 
they do not give him the two pistols. They do bring the accomplice, and they do bring a Ford blue Ford Mustang and park it outside. Um, I think they put the money in the in the car. Now, according to Thief One, he felt his demands would be met because of one. The Swedish opposite, just the the, the, the night, not just the way that these people are. He said the Swedish opposition to violence, and two, that there was a national election uh, taking taking place, not that day, but would going to be. And he he felt that it would be bad for the prime minister to not go along, or for anyway for for the media to make it look like the Prime Minister caused the death of these hostages because he wouldn't, uh, you know, give in to his demands. <clears throat> but look at the Swedish opposition to violence. And I think that that's a problem that we have as Christians. We, we, for, we, we think that when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, that that applies to the church today. It does not. And we take that and we say, well, you know, we don't, we don't need to fight back. We need to be, we need to be timid and we don't need to, uh, to stand up and fight back or anything. And that's wrong. That's dead wrong. Completely wrong. Uh, first of all, Jesus, uh, the, the turn the other cheek, is not to the church today. It's not. Paul said, if possible, live peaceably with all men. That's what's for today. That's the gospel of grace for the church today. Sometimes people don't let you live peaceably. And at that point, you have to respond appropriately. Secondly, as a as a man, as a husband, as a, as a dad, you are... Uh, commanded by God to be a protector of your family. How can you protect them if you are not willing to be violent if violence is required? Now, am I saying that in every situation, if somebody comes up and, and says something, in a, you know, just says an inappropriate word that you need to shoot them in the face, that is not what I'm saying at all, and if you take it that way, then you you need to grow up. You need to mature, because that's what's happening right now. You've got people out there. I just I saw an article the other day where this guy, he got rear-ended by a husband, a wife, and their daughter was in the car. Uh, the, 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 the family rear-ended him. He got mad, got out of his car, and shot all three of them and drove and drove off. Because he, it, because they hit his car. Really. But that's what we're living in. Now. You want to apply that to this, that man. Let's say that that man was was Christian, and it was his responsibility to protect his family, and, you know. Whenever I'm in an accident, I don't get out of the car. And if you get out of the car, there is, uh, believe me, I'm, I'm looking for things for you to do that are odd that you shouldn't be doing, things that you have in your hand or whatnot, and I will respond. And that is the way it is supposed to be. You protect your family by being prepared and being ready to respond. That's part of your calling for God. You know, this this mess of turn the other cheek, no, that's kingdom gospel. Have to rightly divide. So there they have this Swedish opposition to violence. So that he automatically uh had stuff going for him. He 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 knew that hey they don't like violence, so if I threaten violence, they're going to give in to me. Now this guy he was he he'd already been in trouble with the law. This is not his first go around, 
So it's not like he's some kind of amateur. Uh, he made the statement that I had lives for assets. So he felt that he was he had these lives that he could trade to get what he wanted. And that's the way Satan is. Satan, care, Satan cares nothing about your life. Matter of fact, uh, is why he goes so hard after after young people is because he knows it doesn't take a lifetime of sin to send you to hell. All it takes is not accepting Christ. And if he can get you to do something stupid young and kill you off young, he's got you. And that that's, that's his goal, is to take your life. Uh, to emphasize his resolve, okay, to show emphasis, he grabs Elizabeth by the throat and jams the gun up against her ribs to show that I'm ready to kill somebody. So see, we see his intent here. We see his intent. All right, I'm going to, uh, we got 36, I'll keep going. All right, so now here, here's, here's the first kind act is the way we'll, we'll put it because they use that a lot. He unties the hostages. So now here's the situation. The police are outside. Actually, the police are inside the building. This is a, like a five-story building, and the police have set up like a little headquarters or whatever on the second floor. Now, he's got the first floor, and, you know, there's nobody down there except for the three ladies and him right now. So... Um, well, no, they, they've already brought the other guy. They brought the, his accomplice. His accomplice is there. So now uh, the accomplice arrives, and he unties the hostages, and the accomplice uses explosives to open one of the uh, cashier drawers. Now, again, this is showing how the, the, the level of uh, intent that these individuals have. There's been shots fired. There's been people shot. And now they're using explosives. The hostages are right there. The hostages see this. All right? Now, we know, we're told in God's Word, we're preached to all the time, we're taught that the devil is out there to destroy us by temptation and and you know when we give in to temptation and, and that that's sin that it doesn't end well either for the lost or for a Christian. All right, well then the the accomplice that shows up, he goes kind of looking around and the fourth hostage, the, the, the one male hostage, Sven, is found hiding in a cabinet or, or, or something. And they, they take him. Now, to walk around, the, the, they want to be able to, to walk around, but they know that they've already got across the street, they've got snipers on top of the buildings. And so what they're going to do is they're going to, when, whenever they move around, they take and, and use these hostages as shields. Again, what does this, what does that show? It shows that this, this, these thieves do not care about these hostages. They don't care. So then they decided the, their, their most defensible position would be inside of the bank vault, which houses all of the safety deposit boxes and all. So they, they move everyone into there. Well, Elizabeth is claustrophobic, and she starts to panic. And so 
what they do is they take a 30 foot piece of rope tied around her neck so that she can walk out of the vault and and walk around and they've still uh you know can can hold on to the rope this is what elizabeth said about that experience she said she said i felt free i felt that they were very kind to let me leave the vault now common sense and all makes us kind of recoil at that and be like what you'll see as we go along how this kind of plays out but i keep going back to look at what's been done guns been shot persons been shot explosives have been used hostages have been used as as shields hostages have been tied up now you've been put on a you as a human being have been put on a leash And the way that you respond to that is to say to all of that. Now, you've experienced all that. The way that you respond to that is to say, I felt free, and I thought that they were very kind. That's how quickly. Now, not only did we have the lady that, that, that yelled out, at the beginning that got that guy shot not only do we have sin that that has deceived that fast but we have sin that has deceived again you've got all of these indicators that this is not a good thing you know look at how sin can can affect us it's never good. Oh yeah, it's good for the moment. Just like Hebrews 11.25 says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, sin, there is pleasure in sin. But there comes a point that there the consequences of that sin have to be paid and you don't get to choose consequences so as a lost person your consequences for not accepting Christ as Savior and just continuing to live in sin the consequence of that sin because it is breaking God's law and because God is a God of justice and because in the end, there is going to be justice. Sin is that, that, that is not covered in the blood of Christ is going to have to require eternal punishment. Because God is a God of justice. It would not be fair and it would not be just for God to let someone that did not accept Christ into heaven with those that did accept Christ because that would not be justice. The breaking of God's law requires justice. So for the lost person to, to not accept Christ means that that sin has to be paid for at some point. Now you may live to be a hundred years old. Okay, well, you lived a hundred years well, and, and you never accepted Christ. Well, now you're going to spend eternity in hell in a place that was never meant for you. You may, you may end up dying early because of sin. 
See, that can happen with a Christian. With a Christian, yeah, you're going to go to heaven. You cannot lose your salvation. But if you choose to live in sin, there is nothing that says that God won't cut your life off early because you are professing to be a Christian, yet you are not living it. You are living like the world, and you are bringing shame upon that name upon his name because what does that do for all of the lost people around you when you're living like the world what does that do for them how does that help them to come to christ it doesn't it shows them that you're doing the same thing they're doing and there's absolutely no difference whatsoever so there's nothing that says that he won't cut your life short all right so we're gonna we're gonna stop there and we'll pick this up next time.